so we've sort of developed a format. We'll stick with it again tonight, where uh, I have a few announcements about what's happening in the club to go through. And then I'll, in short order, turn it over to uh, Victor Davis, our program chair, and he'll introduce the speaker for the night. And that'll take uh, somewhere around an hour, plus or minus. We have plenty of time built into the evening, so there's no particular time constraints. And we will ask you to hold any questions until the very end and hopefully a chance to go through them. And then uh, just to remind also, we are recording this for a future uh, setup on YouTube as well as streaming live. And so um, we will turn the cameras off during the break and then come on again at some time around nine o'clock. Uh, and we'll go through uh, things happening, astronomy by and for members, I like to call it. And you can see a few things listed that we uh, do need to spend some time talking about. So there you go, there's the, the night's agenda. Um, the announcements, uh, most uh, happy for me to say that our membership continues to build even despite these strange times we're in, our total membership is now up to 122. And a number of folks have joined even since the last meeting. And if, and if you are on the list of recent joinees, you're extremely welcome. And I look forward to uh, having chances to get you kn to know you a little bit better. Uh, thanks for becoming a member of AAAP. Um, in sort of the formal line of duty here, I want to mention that we will be holding the annual election at the next monthly meeting in May, where the AAAP officers will be elected. I'll have more to say about that uh, after the break. Um, I wanted to mention to you also that I had an occasion to give a, a presentation during Earth Week uh, festivities going on here in our region on April 21, right in the middle of Earth Week. Earth Week is something that's set up by the Hopewell Valley Regional School District in conjunction with Phobos and the Green Team in Hopewell Valley. And a number of different programs are being planned. I'm sorry, my automatic advancement is going. I hate it when this happens. Um, I have a chance to talk about Hopewell Valley Dark Skies and the impact of light pollution on both astronomy and the natural ecosystem. So if you're interested in doing this, I apologize, I have to hit the button here so it doesn't advance. If you're interested in joining this talk, I'll be giving it at 8.30, or sorry, 8 p.m. on April 21, and you can sign up by going to, uh, basically it's easiest to just um, Google it, but the Friends of Hopewell, Vo Hopewell Valley Open Space uh, Green Week uh, activities, and you can get the uh, registration sign up for that talk. It'd be great to see some AAAP members <laughs> on the uh, on the, the, the talk. Um, YouTube channel, just wanted to mention again, a number of our members have put some time and effort into creating our YouTube channel and the content now has actually started to build up. It's rather impressive. We've got recordings, not only of uh, sessions like tonight's meeting, we have last month's on there. Uh, we have some Astro Video live sessions, some other things going on out at the observatory, some how-to series with a number of us recording things everywhere from what's going on at the observatory, uh, Princeton University, astrophysics, uh, history and background, how to do astrophotography by members. So please do take a, a, a check out of our YouTube channel as it continues to grow, we will continue to put uh, relevant items on there. Um, it's of course impossible to really jot down this URL for the YouTube channel. So the simplest thing to do would be to Google search AAAP or full name Amateur Astronomers of Princeton under YouTube channel. And then you can save a link to our dedicated channel and re refer to it from time to time. And it will continue to be a go-to place for us to put items that are uh, helpful and hopefully um, enjoyable for you to watch. The club has had a lot of constraints on observatory activities and we have found a really good way forward where we can still present the night sky in all its glory through the use of more modern technology using CCD and CMOS cameras with our telescopes. And we've developed a pattern now once a month, the Friday after this meeting, so coming up April 16th, we're gonna have our next Astro Video Live session. And a number of you have been tuning into these. It's been our experience that by showing the Astro video 
or electronically assisted astronomy, the video output from our cameras and piping that right into a Zoom proceeding provides a really good way for us to share and distribute the information. Basically, it will be a Zoom meeting like this one, only the content will be live astronomy feeds from the cameras. And we have the, the great joy of having the setup out at Washington Crossing Park with the C-14 up in the upper left, my own home observatory, a 12 and a half inch reflector in the middle, and Bill Murray's um, five inch astrophysics refractor with a, a CCD camera in the lower left. And these will be on live this Friday night. And we're urging you guys to, uh, to get involved and learn more about how astro video and astrophotography are being done by joining it. It's a very informal session. No expertise is required. Just tune in and enjoy it. Of course, if you're already well along that curve and starting to feel your way into doing your own astro video, your telescope uh, image could be pasted here on the lower right. You can join us live with your own equipment, and it is our ambition and desire to have more and more members joining the live feed with their own hardware from their own setup. So keep that in mind as you uh, explore the amazingness of the new hardware and software technology that has really revolutionized the ability to do astronomy, even from here in central New Jersey. So, of course, uh, spring is galaxy season, and I mentioned this last month, but it's still here and really just shifted one hour from what I showed a month ago. So the central meridian in purple shows you that about 9.30 p.m. on this coming Friday night, when we're doing our astro video, a very uh, nice collection of galaxies will be coming into prime observing position. The little blue ovals you see are all Messier and NGC galaxies of magnitude 11 or better, and there are literally 100 of them. Of course, we can't see all of them, but quite a few of them we can see, and that will be one of the things, some of the things that we'll be targeting if the weather cooperates this Friday night. So uh, please, uh, you know, if you have a chance to consult your star chart, so you're feeling a little bit oriented uh, when, you, when you start up on Friday night, that'd be great, but hope to see you uh, either way. And a couple of these uh, Messier objects, I couldn't resist showing you again some astrophotography I've done from my own rig here, Messier 65 and 66 in Leo. Those will definitely be in the scope on Friday, weather permitting. Um, Another galaxy, uh, the Tiger's Eye galaxy in Ursa Major, incredible spiral structure visible with our astro video. And another one here, I'm going to make this uh, into a bit of an enigma. This is something Messier 96 in Leo, also well timed for this uh, uh, part of the, uh, sorry, the viewing season. And uh, there's a mystery in that image that I'm going to come back to after the break. I didn't give you much of a chance to see it, but I'll bring that image back because there's something very surprising and unusual that I want to dig into the details on after the break. But with that, I think I've said enough, and I am going to turn it over to Victor, who's going to introduce our guest speaker for the night. Um, Victor, you're I on. I promise to keep this short. Um, about 65 million years ago or so, at the end of the Cretaceous period, an asteroid impact initiated a mass extinction that, among other things, is famously thought to have ended the reign of the dinosaurs. Less well-known are even larger impact events that took place between three and a half to 2.3 billion years ago. Uh, Professor Devatsis, uh, our guest speaker for tonight, will talk about 18 spheral beds identified in rocks in Western Australia and South Africa that represent 13 separate impact events that would have local, regional, and global effects lasting seconds to decades after the impacts. Particularly large impacts, such as those in the Precambrian may have resulted in earthquakes, ejection of rock vapor, evaporation in the oceans, and delivery of elements essential to life. Discovery and confirmation of these impact layers is critical for our understanding of the rate of impacts to the early earth and solar system. This is gaining importance as researchers revisit and redefine the concept of a late heavy bombardment. Um, a few words about our speaker, um, uh, Professor Devatz's interests are planetary geology, sedimentology, early earth processes, and geoscience education. She earned her BA from Pomona College and her PhD from Stanford University. 
Before coming to Temple, Dr. Devotsis was a postdoctoral fellow at the NASA Ames Research Center, working with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter Team. She received an NSF Career Award to study meteor impacts and their effects on the early Earth and the evolution of life. Her field work takes her to the deserts of South Africa, Western Australia, and Southern California. Dr. Devotsis collaborates with cognitive scientists to study spatial reasoning in the geosciences and machine learning and aerial drones. Her scholarly work has been published in a variety of journals. Uh, in 2020, she received the Lindback Award for Distinguished Teaching at Temple University. So with that, I welcome uh, Professor Devotsis. Thank you very, very much. Um, it's, thank you all for, thank you, Victor, for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for, um, for inviting me here today. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. I think it might, oh, there we go. Um, I had to stop sharing mine first, so. Perfect, okay. Um, so you should see my title screen, is that? Good. Yes, that? good, we're there. Wonderful, wonderful, okay. Um, so as Victor said, today I'm going to talk about Precambrian meteor impacts and the implications for the early Earth. And oh. so I have a lot of big questions. Um, and researchers in general have a lot of big questions about the early Earth. And um, so one of these questions is, what do we know about the rate of impacts to the early Earth? So how often were meteors actually hitting the, the Earth as, as well as the inner solar system? And we'll talk a little bit about the late heavy bombardment in just a moment. Also, when and how did oxygen rise in the atmosphere? This is a really important question that you know, we have this idea of a great oxygenation event at about two and a half to 2.3 billion years ago. And um, so exactly how did that happen and when did that happen is, is one of these big overarching questions. Another question that's in some extent related to that is, was there plate tectonics in the Archean? The Archean is a time period between 2.5 billion years ago and 4 billion years ago. And one of the questions is sort of, when did plate tectonics start to arise on the Earth? As you all know, Earth is the only planet that has plate tectonics on it. And so we're special in that way, but it, we didn't start off with plate tectonics. So how did plate tectonics develop on Earth? And when did it um, develop on Earth? And along that same line, when did we start to get continental crust? Because we're fairly unique, again, in the solar system for having continental crust. So how did that, how did that develop and how much did that develop over time? So one of the problems with studying the Archean in particular and studying the early Earth is that we are very much limited by the availability of Archean rock, of early Earth rock, right? All of the processes, volcanoes erupt and cover up our rock or um, weathering occurs and weathers down a rock, where plate tectonics recycles the rocks. And so we have um, very few older rocks preserved today that can really tell us about this early earth environment. And two of the main places where we have these nicely well-preserved Archean rocks are in South Africa and Western Australia. So I'll talk a lot about those locations here. But what I was wondering is, how can we find out a little bit more about the diversity of rocks, um, specifically of the crust of the earth um, from the early earth environment, something separate from just these two isolated small locations on earth. And I think the answer to that is by looking at meteor impacts because these bolides come in, they hit the planet. And then what I'll show you is they spew rock all over the planet. They, globally, especially these very large impacts, leave a global record that um, is, has a signature of that single isolated location where it hit. And because we have lots and lots of impacts over the planet, we can actually get little windows into the Archean Earth and the diversity of rocks from the Archean Earth. Okay, so this idea of a late heavy bombardment has been around for a little while. Um, and the idea behind it is that starting with 
the time of Earth's formation, when there's still a lot of material in the solar system that's getting accreted into planets, we're going to be having a lot of impacts hitting our Earth, along with all of the other planets in the inner solar system. But that over time, as that material starts to get accreted, it, that impact rate starts to die off. So here on the y-axis is our impact rate. So that impact rate starts to die off. And you can look at this dashed line either way. And then eventually by the time we get to today, this only goes to 2.5 billion years ago, but by the time you get to today, we have a fairly low rate of impact, fortunately for us. Now, the idea of a late heavy bombardment is that, um, is that we have this, uh, a rather sharp decline occurring, and then there's this peak at between four and 3.8 billion years ago. Now, during this peak is what we call the late heavy bombardment, and this is because uh, we, you know, we're able to send um, and uh, send men up to the moon and collect samples. Um, the Apollo collection um, brought back rocks, and what, and they did a lot of age dating of these rocks, and they found that almost all of the impact rocks were 3.9 billion years old. So we have this huge peak. All of a sudden, everything from an impact is 3.9 billion years old, and none were older. And so this led to this development of this idea. And we have a lot of meteorites from Mars and these confirm this idea. However, um, and, and so before I get to that, we also have zircons from the Jack Hills of Western Australia. And they suggest based on oxygen isotopes within the zircons that there was a cool early earth. So it suggests it went down and then popped back up. It actually got cool here on earth for a little while and then temperatures went back up again during this late heavy bombardment. This is the idea. However, maybe not. I'm gonna argue that this is maybe a false idea. Um, the first thing is that we're finding out that all of the samples that have been collected from the moon are basically sampling embryos. And so there's a single impact event that's getting sampled over and over and over and over again. So we're getting confirmation of lots of impacts, but it's all a single impact. And so this data set is actually biased. The second is that I'm gonna say, well, maybe there's this tail, maybe there was this spike up, but based on what we're seeing on earth, maybe we had an extended late heavy bombardment, right? So maybe um, it didn't drop back suddenly after this, this late heavy bombardment time, but maybe it continued for a little bit of time because we are seeing so many impacts between 3.5 and 2.5 billion years ago. And in fact, many people are reading this idea. And so here in yellow, you can see the, um, this idea of the late heavy bombardment. And you can see in red, this idea of a gradual decline. So some people are saying, well, maybe it's a gradual decline and we're just hitting this late heavy bombardment you know, during this decline. There's another idea called the sawtooth model in which there's actually several peaks of impacts that have occurred. They're, they're decreasing each time. Um, and Bill Botke has written some, has had several papers on this if you're interested in learning more about the sawtooth model. Um, and and um, basically they're perturbations of the asteroid belt that occur periodically through history, which would create this heavy intense bombardment periodically in, within the inner solar system. Okay, so I probably don't need to explain to this group why this matters and why we care about impacts and why we care about impact rates. But one of the things that has come up in recent years and this paper by O'Neill et al in 2017 suggests that impacts may have, you know, are, maybe are not just destructive um, actors in our solar system killing off the dinosaurs. We know that happened 65 million years ago, but um, they may have also been really active and important components of the geologic system. And it even may have triggered plate tectonics on our solar system. So he has two models, one where you have impacts where plate tectonics develops on the planet and one without impacts where it doesn't. Um, and, and in fact, some Jack Hill zircons also record some evidence of plate tectonics um, pretty early on in Earth's history. And we'll get back to that in a moment. So, and in addition, the other reason we really care is because there are tremendous environmental effects from these impacts. So um, 
we can extrapolate from what we know of the KPG impact event that killed the dinosaurs, that you know, dust and soot was distributed over the planet. There's gases that are um, released during the impact event. Um, some evidence suggests that during the, even the KPG impact, um, the earth was cooked to the temperature of a pizza oven for a short period of time. So there are thermal effects. We're getting a lot of rapid sedimentation, extinction, evaporation of water, tsunamis, earthquakes, tremendous number of effects. And we're seeing this even in the KPG boundary, and I'll show you in a bit later, the impacts that I'm interested and in, I'm working on are even bigger than that. They're orders of magnitude larger in scale. So they would have had tremendous effects to the early Earth environment when life was just starting to take hold on our planet. So the way that I find these impact layers um, is by searching for what we call spherical. Because we have such a little rock on the planet, we do not have a tremendous number of craters that are preserved on Earth. In fact, we have none that are Archean in age that are, well, um, we have very few that are old um, craters present on the Earth. But what happens during an impact event is that the bolide, let's say it's a carbonaceous chondrite, comes in, it hits the planet. That bolide, if it's a big enough um, meteor, it will actually, um, or asteroid, I should say, it will actually vaporize when it hits, the entire um, asteroid will vaporize. It will also vaporize a tremendous amount of the rock that it hits. That vaporized material explodes up like an atomic bomb in a plume, and that plume then goes out and circles the Earth. Eventually, as it cools down, the rock that has vaporized begins to cool, it condenses, it forms spherical particles that rain out all over the planet in a global distribution. And these spherules, we call them, are basically rock hail. So it's, it basically hails all over the planet. But what that means is that when we go to these locations in South Africa and Western Australia, we can find these individual impact layers, even if the impact occurred on the other side of the planet. So this is what these spherules look like in thin section. So this is a microscopic view of the spherules. You can see all these little round particles. They're very um, heterogeneous. They're very mixed in composition. Um, and then over here on the left, you can see the scale of the Earth's geologic history. So we start with the um, Hadean, um, you know, which ended about 4 billion years ago into the Archean, then the Proterozoic and the Phanerozoic. And the black bars that I've put onto this, um, to this timeline here represent individual spherical beds that are present on the Earth today, okay? Now, I'm interested in this orange zone and specifically in these black um, layers and in these individual impact layers that occurred sort of the middle part of the Archean and the end of the Archean. So, you know, if you look at this, you start to see some patterns, right? There's a whole lot of impacts occurring all in, during this middle part and then during this sort of transition between the Archean and Proterozoic. And then it sort of starts to peter out a little bit. Um, it may be that these gaps in this record are due to the fact we just haven't found them yet. Um, one of the problems is we just don't have the rock material from this period of time. We have, um, in the mid Archean, we have the Barberton Greenstone Belt in South Africa and the Pilbara in Western Australia. And I'll talk about some of those rocks. And then also the Hammersley in Western Australia and Transvaal in South Africa. We've got some rock material, but we don't have much that's of an age um, in between those, those time periods. And so some of it may be because there are these pulses of impacts, or it could be that we just don't have available rock. But even though we can debate the rates, we know that heavy bombardment clearly lasted through the Archean. Again, because we're seeing 18 different impact layers that likely represent 13 impacts because some of them we actually can correlate between Western Australia and South Africa. Here's an example where we have in South Africa, here's a stratigraphic section where we've got three impact layers um, that are these thin gray bars here that are correlated to Western Australia to um, these three impact layers. So we can actually see based on um, age dating, um, some of the properties of the spherules themselves, 
um, and its relationship within the stratigraphic column, we can actually correlate them across continents because they're global deposits. Now, we also have to confirm that these impact layers are in fact related to impacts, to meteor impacts. Um, and we do this through a variety of different techniques. One is by using spinels, which I'll talk a little bit later on in this talk. Um, but iridium, of course, is a great tracer of exogenous material, of extraterrestrial material. Um, and this gray bar, there's a lot going on on this chart, don't worry about it, but this gray zone is basically chondritic zone of uh, chondritic material. So uh, asteroids um, that are carbonaceous or ordinary chondrites all fall within this, this gray zone in terms of its relationship between iridium and chromium. Terrestrial rocks tend to have a lot more chromium relative to their abundance of, of iridium. And all of these colored triangles and squares and hexagons um, and these bicolored um, dots are all um, impact layer. Um, they're all spherical beds from South Africa um, or Western Australia. Okay, now the size of these impacts are a little bit hard to estimate. We don't have the crater itself. We don't have the meteorite, right? Because the meteorite's non-existent, it's vaporized because um, it's so big. So what we do have though with the spherules is we can actually use the iridium content, the chromium content, um, chromium isotopes, and the size of the spherules to make estimates as to how big these impacts were. And I'm gonna draw your attention to these blue bars because these are the ones that I think are, are really, um, that, that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later on in this talk. Um, this is the S3 impact layer, which is about 3.24 billion years ago. And this is the Parabidou impact layer, which is about 2.57 billion years ago. But you'll see that all of these impact layers, and there's huge error bars here. You can see these vertical lines represent the range of sizes based on the different estimates and the different proxies we use. But the impact or diameter of some of these early mid-Archean impacts are between 30 and 70 kilometers in diameter in comparison to the KPG, which is more like 10 to 12, right? So um, these are significantly larger impacts that, that we're seeing um, in the early mid-Archean and late Archean. Now, if we plot some of those curves that we talked about before, right, where we've got, you know, sort of this gradual decay in terms of the um, amount of impacts that we're having through time. We can see that that plots on this chart fairly well. Um, again, we've got huge error bars that we're working with. But if we also look at that sawtooth model that I introduced you to earlier, you can see that that also fits into this pretty well. What I'll say is this Greenland impact is, is this anomaly. It's probably standing out to you. But what's going on here? Now, what I will say is with this Greenland impact is we have very poor constraints on the age. So this could actually move quite a bit in either direction. We also have very poor constraints on the impact itself. We have very, very small samples from a very hard to reach place in Greenland. I have like a tiny rock that's about this big um, because it's so hard to get to the sample site location. So I would take this a little bit with a grain of salt. Okay, so now I'm gonna to get to how we use these to tell us a little bit about the rise of oxygen in our atmosphere. So as I mentioned before, at about two and a half to 2.3 billion years ago, there's this idea of the great oxygenation event. So we had relatively low levels of oxygen in our atmosphere. It suddenly rose and then we had another kind of brief um, rise up again just after the snowball earth event. Now, there may have been these whiffs of oxygen. This has been argued for already. Um, but my goal of my, some of the goals of my work were to identify and measure some, the geochemistry of some redox sensitive minerals that formed within the plume. Because again, these minerals are forming during this condensation within the atmosphere. So they are in this really unique position to tell us about the atmosphere at the time of this impact event. So again, I'm gonna talk about that S3 layer and the Parabidou spherical layer from 3.24 billion years ago and 2.57 billion years ago. And these little black 
blobs on here and these sort of dendritic looking things on here. These are nickel rich chromites. They're very unique to impact spherules um, and impact rocks. And um, here you can see them showing up in white. This is in backscatter electrons from the SEM. Um, similar here, they're in white. Um, and these minerals are very unique in that they contain within them iron. They have an iron content to them. They have nickel, they have chromium, and they have iron. And so I thought, well, we can look at the redox um, state of these individual chrome spinels to tell us a little bit about the impact event. Okay, this is a very busy graph and I want you only to look at the very top part here. So if you look at this top, you can see the Fe3 plus to total Fe ratio. This is basically a, a measure of how oxidized the sample is or how oxidized the mineral is. The higher up it is, the more oxidized it is. The lower down, the less oxidized, okay? So you can see these red dots up here. These are all from the KPG impact 65 million years ago, well after oxygen levels were at current atmospheric level. Here we have in green, the S3 layer from 3.24 billion years ago. And in blue, we have the Parabidu sphere layer from 2.57 billion years ago. And what should strike you is that these are significantly lower. In fact, they're only slightly higher than these purple ones, which come from volcanic rocks in the region. So these purple ones all come from um, commodiotic samples in, the, in South Africa. So um, if you actually um, look at the iron to three, iron three plus to total iron ratio in spinels, we can plot this data, sort of the, the range of the data that we see for the KT spinels, it ranges from between eh, approximately 80 to 100% atoms of Fe3 plus. Um, you know, for the Barberton Greenstone belt, it's smaller. Now, this black line that's here is actually from experimental data in which they um, melted meteorite samples and then recondensed and recooled and, and, and crystallized spinel under different redox conditions, so under different oxygen fugacities. And what they ended up finding is that there is, of course, a relationship of the Fe3 plus ratio to the oxygen fugacity in which it formed. So we can use this and we can plot our Barberton Greenstone belt spinels from the S3 layer, as well as the Parabidu spherule layer range, and sort of look at what the maximum level of oxidation or uh, what the maximum um, oxygen fugacity might be. And we get approximately 10 to the negative four bar or 10 to the negative four times modern atmospheric level. So if we then, we can then put these little orange boxes which say, okay, oxygen levels had to have been lower than these levels um, during the um, Archean, right? So these orange bars, I, I put a bar here for 10 to the negative four, but it's actually, I think, lower than that because during these big impacts, you're going to vaporize not only the rock itself, but a bunch of gases that are contained within the rock and a bunch of water. In fact, three to 30 meters of seawater globally will be vaporized during these events. So we may actually be getting some of these whiffs of oxygen that are associated with these impact events that are actually um, giving us a temporary source of oxygen in the atmosphere. Okay, now the other thing that I promised to tell you about was the Archean crust. Right, and whether or not plate tectonics and continental crust was formed. And again, remember these impacts are, are hitting lots of different places on the earth. And so the goal of this part of the work was to develop a mixing model of the target, which is the crust, with the bolide or with the, the asteroid um, that is identical to the geochemical composition of the spherules, right? The, the bolide is being vaporized, the rock is being vaporized, and it's going up, it's mixing, and then coming back down as this new rock type. How can we mix those components in order to tell us a little bit something about what the crust composition was like? So in order to do this kind of mixing model, it has to assume that sedimentary cover is insignificant relative to the impacts. Because these are such big impacts, that doesn't matter. It really requires that we have big impacts to do this kind of project. So the first thing I did was identify spherule beds that were good to use for this. I needed spherule beds that didn't have tsunamis and other detritus mixed in from you know, local or regional sources. I wanted just these pure spherules for my, for my research. 
Um, this is me sitting here. And just to give you a sense of how hard it is to find these impact layers, I'm guessing most of you cannot see the um, spherical bed layer. I'm gonna put my cursor on it here. It's really, the cursor is actually much bigger than the layer, but can you see the sort of beige thing sticking in here between the red layers right there? That's the spherical layer. It's two centimeters thick. Um, in comparison to this big stack of red banded carbonates, um, ferruginous carbonates. Um, here we are looking at another impact layer. Again, the same. this is the same impact layer at a different location. Um, again, so hard to see these things um, and so hard to find, which is why we think there's probably a lot more than we've even found to date. Um, but I wanted to have ones that I could find in a lot of different locations because um, again, if they're getting altered differently, I can use that to understand these a little bit better. So then what I did is I, I settled on, a couple, I'm gonna talk about S3 and Parabadu again. Um, these are two of the best, really the best uh, preserved locations that I have. And um, what I'm gonna do is identify the immobile or incompatible elements. So a lot of alter, these rocks have been sitting on the surface for as much as you know 3 billion years, they're going to be altered a little bit. So I wanted to find the, the um, elements that are going to be the least likely to move around in the geologic system. And so I settled on this group of, of elements. Um, Iridium is really critical for identifying the component that's the meteorite, for uh, uh, de defining the percentage of meteoritic component. Um, but then these other elements all were um, very stable within the geologic system. And I did a lot of research into the diagenesis to, to identify that. Okay, now this is going to look slightly scary and like a big, huge mess, but bear with me here because those elements that I just defined are plotted here. This is called a spidergram and um, it's, it's normalized to a CV chondrite, um, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, and then what all of these different lines are that look like spiders are all characteristic um, patterns of these elements within different rock materials. So the, I have a CV chondrite because it's normalized to a CV chondrite is by definition just a flat one. So all the elements get one. And then all of the other patterns are ratioed to a CV chondrite. And what you can see here is that they each have this really unique pattern. I wanted to, to show this here so you could see, you know, in some cases, you know, titanium is really high, in some cases, titanium is low. Um, this red one, um, really, the, which is depleted more mantle, you know, has this really interesting um, sort of flatter line here that pops up as you go on. Anyway, the point is they're all fairly unique patterns. And so what I wanted to do is identify which of these rocks are going to be mixed with my CV chondrite, I'll explain why I pick CV in a moment, in order to create this thicker red line, which is the, my, the geochemical analysis I did on my spherical beds. So my spherules have this very characteristic spidergram. Can I mix these other rocks together to create that same pattern is my question. Now I picked the CV chondrite for a very specific reason. We have chromium isotopes on this, these rocks that um, suggest that um, they are, um, are, are from the carbonaceous chondrite group. They have a negative chromium anomaly. Happy to explain that to anybody later if you're interested more in this. But they also have raw chromium isotopes that are closest to the CV chondrite. So that helps us identify what um, the meteor itself or what the asteroid itself was. Um, and then what I did is a principal component analysis to identify what rock types are going to be most likely to be in my mixing model. And then I ran this model thousands and thousands of times trying to reduce the um, squared residual, okay, of my different mixes. And I did um, everything from a two component mix of let's say a CV chondrite plus a um, continental crust to a five component um, mix. And in the end, what I found was the best mix, which here you can see how my model matches my um, data down on uh, under C here. Um, and you can see that my model matches up pretty well to that pattern. And that is with a 15% CV chondrite 
65% ocean basalt, which is mostly actually um, normal type mid-ocean ridge basalt, though I can add small amounts of apex basalt, which is an Archean basaltic rock into there and it doesn't change it much. Um, and 20% depleted morb mantle, which means 20% of the rock that's being put into these, um, that's being excavated is from the mantle. Now that seems crazy until you actually start to do the math on the different scales of these impacts. So if we use the most conservative estimate that we have for the size of this bolide, we have a diameter of 30 kilometers. Okay, so it, this S3 has been estimated to be as large as 70 kilometers, but I'm, I'm just using my bottom limit. And you do um, a scaling measurement. It basically gives you a transient crater diameter of 159 kilometers and a final crater diameter of 556 kilometers. What that then translates to in terms of depth is that it would have excavated down to about 16 kilometers into the Earth's surface. So imagine this impact excavating 16 kilometers into the surface. Um, even if the ocean crust were thicker than it is today, it's still you know, definitely not gonna be more than 10 kilometers thick. That would be extraordinarily thick ocean crust, right? And so it's clearly going to excavate into the mantle. So we don't actually have a problem with that being in our model, that works. Now we did the same thing with the paraproducerial layer here. I'm zoomed in on that spherical bed a little bit so you can see it a little bit more up close here. Um, and in this particular case, we again um, used platinum group elements and identified this impact to be an LL chondrite, so an ordinary chondrite as opposed to carbonaceous chondrite. Um, I did a similar um, principal component analysis and I was able to model the results. The best I could do here um, gave me a 50% L or LL chondrite, 15% uh, continental crust and 35% um, plateau basalt or ocean island basalt. And it could, either one could really go in without, with only minor changes to the model. So this is really interesting because it's a completely different mix, right? There's no mantle getting um, included into this mix, but instead we're having continental crust. Again, if we do the same kind of conservative estimate, I'm gonna use the smallest size of the impactor that we can estimate it at, which is 17 kilometers is the smallest estimate we have. Um, this results in a transient diameter of 102 kilometers, a 330 kilometer diameter final crater, and a 10 kilometer deep um, excavation. If you're talking about continental crust, our continental crust is much, much thicker than our, um, our, our ocean crust, right? And so for continental crust, if we're only excavating 10 kilometers, if you were to excavate 10 kilometers into our continental crust today, you would still be in continental crust in most places, maybe not um, entirely. But this lack of mantle in this mix is consistent with a shallower, smaller impact into continental crust. So we're still at least internally consistent here. The other thing is that we are having a larger mix of the bolide that is also consistent with a smaller impact, right? So less of the rock gets vaporized from the target um, as far as a ratio goes. I did a gut check on all of this um, and I tested against the KPG where we actually know that there is, we actually know what the target rocks are and we know what the, um, we've got a little bit more information and we can test the spherules themselves. Um, I, I don't have a full complete mix because it's a slightly different problem because it's looking at sedimentary rocks as opposed to thicker crust and it's a smaller impact. But what you can see is that these spidergrams are again, fairly internally consistent and they're, they're matching up quite well and they're significantly different from what we see in our earlier Archean impacts. So then to put this into context with our continental crust development on earth, we have lots and lots of models. And in fact, there are lots of scientists who are arguing a lot about whether or not continental crust forms on the Earth very early on and has stayed sort of consistent throughout Earth's history, or whether or not it took a very, very long time for continental crust to evolve. I think most people are fairly comfortable with this Taylor and McLennan model in which you get a sort of a sudden rise around you know, sometime in the mid-Archean that sort of rises up and then plateaus out. 
And in fact, if we plot our data points, again, I'm putting these two blue lines here for context, our S3 layer um, is, is fairly early on. So it's consistent with not very much continental crust being available. But our Parabajou layer, which in fact did have continental crust in the mix, is during a time where there's probably a lot of development of continental crust on our Earth. Um, so it's at least, that's again, internally consistent or consistent with a lot of these other researchers who are arguing for this sort of rise again around 3 billion years ago. So sort of to summarize, um, what this all means is that because we're seeing normal type mid-ocean ridge basalt, mid-ocean ridge implies plate tectonics, it's, it's a spreading center, right? So we're getting basalt that's consistent with plate tectonic formation, and we're getting a depleted more mantle um, consistent with the sort of start of extraction of continental crust and plate tectonics. So what this is telling us is that as early as 3.24 billion years ago, we probably had plate tectonics. Um, but some interesting things is that we, that we don't have um, shock zircons and we don't have abundant continental crust because we're not hitting it. But by the time we get to the late Archean, we are starting to hit this. And I should say, I've started to do this, this modeling on a variety of the different impact layers. And we're seeing it particularly in the late Archean that most of these impacts have at least some continental signature. Um, so I already explained that. And so just sort of to end this all up, I think there's a lot more work that's needed to identify the cratering rate um, of the early earth um, and the inner solar system really. And, um, and we do have to recognize that impacts are an important geologic process, particularly on the early earth. Um, what we see in the greenstones of South Africa and Australia are just you know, one individual type location, but the diversity of rocks over the earth were probably very different as they are today. Um, and so we can use these impacts to help teach us about that. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge NSF for funding and, and my wonderful graduate students. Uh, Katrina graduated last year um, and some of the, my other students who have graduated in the past few years as well, who worked on this project. And I'm happy to take questions. Okay, I, I wanted to ask about whether or not uh, volcanic eruptions can mimic the spherules you're finding because of uh, asteroid impacts. Yes, so um, with um, volcanic impacts, we often get spherical particles as well, but they are what we call accretionary lapilli. Um, and that means that they have, do you want me to stop sharing or do you want me to keep this up in case people have questions about it? Do you have a preference? I I'd keep it up, I, yeah. Okay, I'll just keep it up. Um, so accretionary lapilli are actually very texturally different inside, but they are easily confused. And especially in the Archean, we see a lot of volcan these volcanic accretionary lapilli that look like the spherical beds, but they are in fact um, ashy in composition. And, and actually, if you look at it in thin section, here, let me see if I can go back to the, um, uh, let me see if I can, oops, as I ended my show, it, it went back. Hold on, I'll share it again. And I'm just gonna go to the regular view here. Um, I showed a picture at the beginning of these spherules. And as you can see, they look fairly smooth or they have sort of a glassy texture to them. Um, the accretionary lapilli actually look like little shards of glass that form these sort of concentric circles. Um, and so you can tell within an instant of looking at them in thin section that they're different. Um, and they also tend to be larger. So they tend to be um, bigger in size. The biggest these particles tend to get are about four millimeters in diameter. And those are the really big ones. Mostly they're much smaller than that. Okay. Yeah, I have another question. This picture that you have up here, it looks very similar to um, these marble things that you put on, on countertops and stuff very often. You know, you, is, it, is that from the same period? Are these little spherules what I'm seeing there on, on, those, on those marble countertops? So in those marble countertops, what you're actually probably, so there's a lot of these spherical types of particles in geology. 
which is a little bit, again, another aspect of this, why these are so freaking hard to find. Um, but those are probably um, the, the small particles that you're seeing um, are probably um, oolites. Um, sorry, I was to, trying to reach for the name there. They're probably oolites, which are actually um, these little balls that form, especially around um, in uh, environments, shallow water environments, um, where where particles are sort of collecting this um, um, this material around maybe some sort of grain of sand or something similar. But oolites are, are also really very common in the geologic record, and they tend to be often associated with limestones and other kinds of rocks like that. Got it. Uh, and I've got another question. You know, in your picture, you showed the, para, is it Parabadu? That, that, when, when that happened back in two and a half billion years ago, there's a big gap then after that with these large impacts between that one and then the KPG event. Is there a theory mm -hmm. as to why, you know, there's this large gap in time versus the pre you know, Parabadu where there seem to be a lot more of those Im large impacts? Yeah, so, I mean, it really seems that uh, at really, I would say around 2 billion years ago, we start to flatline to, um, to more like modern day rates. So no matter which of these models we pick, by about two billion years ago, we seem to be reaching essentially a, a, a static level in which you might get sporadic um, impact events. There's also a lot more recent models that are looking at um, different ways in which there are potentially perturbations of the asteroid belt in particular, right? The asteroid belt is made out of lots and lots of rings of belts. And individual rings can be um, perturbed. So in, when they came up with this idea of the late heavy bombardment, the reason they, um, the, the Nice hypothesis, which was a, a bunch of scientists got together in Nice, France, and which would have been lovely, I think, um, and sat around and talked and came up with this idea. And basically, as the outer solar system was doing a little bit of reorganization, it perturbed this inner part of the, the asteroid belt that then came in and slammed into um, the inner solar system. But that's not, it's potentially we're seeing these pulses that are happening periodically um, that are again, just due to one reason or another that's causing this perturbation. So, you know, hopefully, um, you know, and that may have caused this KPG impact. It, maybe it didn't, maybe it's just part of, you know, sort of the stochastic um, you know, by chance happening, that's going mm. to happen. It's sort of a low level of impacts, right? Um, you know, there's a couple of other ones I showed. Um, an example, there's the Altanen impact, which was actually into the ocean. Um, and we have some in the Eocene and stuff like that. There, there are more and we're learning more about them. But again, um, if an impact is too small, basically the KPG impact is at about our threshold at which we'll have a global deposit. Anything smaller than that, we won't necessarily have a record that gets preserved of it. Mm -hmm. Hope I sort of answered your question. Yep, thank you. I have a, actually two questions. How would the angle of impact affect the amount of material that gets ejected? And also how would that affect the depth of the excavation? Those are great questions. Um, so it will absolutely affect the depth. And so, you know, these are, these are basically, these are, um, you know, my calculations are simply based on a near vertical impact, of course, right? Um, the, as these impacts, so, so there's been some modeling work and I'm not a modeler. So I'm going to try and, and do my best to explain what some of the modelers have, have done. Um, one of the problems is they, they sort of run into this trouble of trying to find funding. It's, it's often very difficult to get funding to do modeling of impacts because people don't think of it as being relevant or important, um, but they have done some modeling of, of impact angle. Certainly you get a reduction in terms of the total energy and certainly you get a difference in the distribution of material. For these very large impacts, it doesn't really matter too much because the size of them are so big relative to the body. They're still um, 
going to have, unless it's a, it's a truly oblique impact, right? They're still going to, if you know, if you're in the 45 degree range ish, you know, or even, you know, down to like 25 degrees, it doesn't make too much of a difference. Um, when you get down to smaller impacts, it actually matters more um, how oblique the impact is in terms of the crater diameter and the energy introduced and, and the like. Um, did I answer both questions? What, or am I missing part? Yeah. Well, the, the other part was how much material would be ejected on an oblique uh, impact versus a, a right angle impact or vertical impact. It's mostly about the, the, the spatial distribution of those impacts, um, it seems. For an oblique impact, you're just going to get, obviously, a, a very different ejecta blanket. But in terms of the vaporized material, the jury is still out. So some of the models suggest that there is a raid-like distribution of the plume, and some of the models suggest it's more of just a, a general expanding plume. So for the vaporized material, at this point, we see, you know, a lot of these, for the KPG impact, for example, you know, everywhere where we've looked for it, we see it, these spherical beds. Um, so it does not appear to be rayed, but that's still an open-ended question. And we don't really have clear models one way or the other for the, for the gas component of this. Okay, thank you. Given that these layers are so narrow, when were the first identified as being caused by impacts rather than by sedimentation? Yeah, so um, they, and, and uh, what I should say is the S3 spherical bed is actually, because it's such a big impact, is actually 30 centimeters thick. So it's a much thicker deposit than the Peribidu. The Peribidu is sort of, you know, a much smaller impact, so it's a much thinner bed. Um, but these um, impact layers and, and S1, um, which actually is the oldest, um, was discovered by my PhD advisor back in the 80s. Um, and they thought, again, that these were these volcanic accretionary lapilli when they collected these samples. Um, uh, so Gary Byerly and Don Lowe, um, who are both on my PhD committee, have been working in South Africa for a very, very long time, since the 80s, and um, have been mapping the Barbage and Greenstone belts. Um, as part of the mapping, they collected these samples. When they cut into them in thin section, they noticed they were a little bit unusual um, and started to do a little bit more work, eventually got some iridium analyses done on them um, and the like. Of course, you know, the 80s were sort of this time also, you know, Alvarez came out with a, with a KPG impact idea in 1980. So, you know, people were just really starting to recognize these individual impact layers and, and what they look like. Um, you alluded to this uh, a little bit, but uh, what does the timing and the, uh, the size of these impactors tell you about the evolution of the solar system? Um, well, so, uh, I, I guess I, th that starts to get far, too far out of my comfort zone, I would say, is to, to make sort of more broad generalizations about the solar system. Um, but what I will say is that um, by looking at some of these terrestrial rocks, I, I think what we've done is we've started to force people to realize, oh, we need to look at um, the lunar rocks in better detail, and we need to look at the Martian impact record in better detail, right? So we, it's sort of, um, I think, pushing the planetary community to, you know, realize that, oh, yes, they were resampling a single impact event when they're, when they're looking at these Apollo rocks, right? So, um, and in fact, when they started to actually look at the, the, the smaller size particles from some of these samples that were returned from Apollo, they're starting to find more additional ages. So they're actually starting to see, oh yeah, it looks like if we, if we don't just look at a single, you know, the largest particles, but we look at some of the smaller particles as well, we can see more of these ages. So I think this is helping us sort of reevaluate some of our dominant paradigms within the community, like the late heavy bombardment. Um, you know, 
I, I think the lunar community was already realizing that and, and moving in that direction anyway, but this was maybe an, an additional push. Um, and so, um, you know, it helps the, the broader community because we're all tied together, right? Within the solar system, the inner solar system, we're all sort of, should be in, in many ways mirroring each other. And so I teach planetary geology and I always say that, you know, my students have only had terrestrial geology until they take my class. They take my class senior year and they say, okay, you think you understand what's going on on earth now, see if you can apply those geologic processes to other planets. And if it doesn't apply, then you don't really understand that geologic process, right? And so all of the planets have all these same geologic processes, um, but understanding how they work and how they're a little different on each of the planets is what kind of makes it interesting and, and helps us learn. A question, a couple of questions, but one just a, a quick one about how you operate as a scientist. So a lot of the really detailed analysis you're doing is coming from mass spec analysis of the various isotopes of these interesting elements. Do you guys do that like in your own labs or do you collaborate with physical chemists or how's that actually going on? Yeah, so almost, almost everything I should say here is in collaboration with other folks over, you know, quite a few years now. I've been working on this kind of stuff for 20 years now with, with different scientists from all over. Um, so, you know, um, the chromium isotopes in particular are very difficult to do and there are very few labs that can actually do those analyses, right? And so uh, we don't have a tremendous amount of data um, from those. Um, Alexander Shikulyakov down in uh, San Diego um, did a lot of that work. Frank Kite did a lot of our iridium analyses. That has to be done by neutron activation, or that was done, I should say, by neutron activation. Um, so, and then um, Stephen Goderas, who did a lot of the, um, um, uh, not rare earth elements, um, platinum group element work, um, uh, is, has been a collaborator of mine in, in more recent years. And so, yes, it's critically important well, in order I, to I mean, compile I, all these data sets. I, work I, I with worked with, with mass spec analysis in like the, in biochemistry and the biopharmaceutical world in, in my career. And I it's, it's, we've lived through an absolute revolu revolution, revelation in the ability of mass spec to get to this level of detail. It absolutely blows me away when I see the kind of data that you're working with. But I actually started in addition to marveling about all the data you got. I wanted to ask a more astronomy question. So you talked a lot about the asteroids. And if you think about the asteroid belt today, I guess it's it's thought that the amount of mass as a fraction of the solar system mass is tiny, uh, really tiny, like fr a fraction, a tiny fraction of the moon even, right? So what is it thought, what what is your what do your studies tell you about the, the mass and the density and the number of asteroids that may have existed back in the, in the millennia ago that you've, the, the billions of years ago that you've been talking about? Has it changed greatly or is it, is it similar? So um, here, I'm gonna pull up a slide here. Um, and I think there's, I, I, I'm gonna sort of answer you with a little bit of a question that I've been pondering. Um, which is uh, down here. Um, I'm gonna show you this, this slide here, which is the, this is the chromium isotopes again. Um, and what you could see here is that these green ones are all the terrestrial rocks. They're all, they're all zero by definition, right? Um, over here in blue are a bunch of chromium isotopes that are all ordinary chondrites and SNCs. So there are Martian meteorites in here too. And then over here on the left are the carbonaceous chondrites. Carbonaceous chondrites by definition are have negative um, chromium isotopes. Ordinary chondrites have positive. What's really interesting is if we look at the early Archean impacts, almost every single one of them, which this S2, S3, S4, they're all carbonaceous chondrites, you know, which are our most primitive meteorites, right? Our most primitive asteroids. And um, if we go, this one doesn't have it actually. Oh, I did have a, a more later one. I had, I had hidden this slide. Um, but if we look at the, the um, later Archean ones, most of them sit to the right. And this to me is a huge mystery. 
why are we getting so many carbonaceous chondrites? And the KPG boundary is also carbonaceous chondrite. So then it's like kind of, it's not what necessarily a pattern. But it seems like we're getting a lot of this more primitive material very early on, right? These, these old carbonaceous chondrites. Um, and then as we move, um, you know, into the later part of the Archean, we're starting to get ordinary chondrites as well as non-chondritic material as our sort as our impactor. Um, and I think that that's really interesting. I don't have an answer as to why. It's a pattern I'm seeing. I think it's important. Um, and I think it may tell us something about sort of this evolution of the solar system and evolution of material within our solar system. Um, it could be sheer dumb luck, but it seems like too many to, to just be that. Um, so one of the problems is, again, because there are very few labs who can do this type of work, um, the, that colleague of mine um, who's in Europe is, is trying to develop another lab to do more of this work, but um, there's sort of this backlog, and so it gets very hard to do these analyses, awesome. um, and they're really trying to get a lot of their meteorites done, um, and so it's hard to get some of our spherical beds analyzed, but um, but it's an interesting trend. So um, whatever that tells you, maybe that tells you more than it tells me, I know as an astronomer, <laughs> um, but I think, I think it's, it's, it's part of this story that hopefully we'll, we'll continue to uncover over the years. Really amazing. We have a question that came in through the chat. Um, is there a collaborative effort with Chinese scientists to analyze the lunar rocks that recently brought back? And um, that's one question. And then I have a question. Do you see any difference between the top of the spheral uh, bed and the bottom? Any variation due to the thickness? Um, so, um... So the first question I'm going to answer first because it's a uh, pretty short. Um, yes, there are, and there are um, actually um, some NASA, NASA initiatives in order to um, to work on those collaborations. I'm not particularly involved in it because I'm not involved in the the lunar sampling um, uh, piece of things. So um, I think I recently heard a talk from Nicole Zellner. She's doing a lot of work on the lunar glasses. I think she's doing some of that. Um, collaboration. Um, but again, that's not something I'm engaged in or involved in, but there are efforts moving forward to try and, 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 um, and uh, do that collaboration because I think it's, it's really important. And more and more like ESA, JAXA, there's so many different space agencies all over the world that are returning really excellent data. So the more we can do collaborations with them, I think the better. Um, and long-term, you know, keeping things within um, national um, controlled or systems are really important because of maintaining planetary protection rules and, and the like. So the more we can communicate, the more we can talk together, the better for, for planetary protection in particular. Um, uh, then your question, tell, ask me again, because- Related to um, any differences that you might see between the thickness of the spheral bed and uh, just reiterate what they're being deposited on and if their ground mass has any play into what you see in the bed. Yeah, so I've been actually been studying those in quite a bit of detail um, because um, one of the things I found my, my very first published paper for my PhD was actually looking at some stratigraphic variability within the individual spherical bed <laughs> because what we can actually see is that um, much like crystals will crystallize at different rates within a volcan like within a, you know, a, a plutonic system, right? Or in a volcanic rock. The same thing is happening in our atmosphere, but in sort of different PT condition, pressure temperature conditions. So what we actually can see from the base to the top of the bed is what I consider to be our condensation sequence yes. in which you're getting the most refractory components that are coming out of the system first. And over time, you're seeing um, a grading into sort of the more, what we might say, the more felsic components. It's, it's mostly basalt and mantle, but um, so it's not truly felsic, but 
um, you're going from, you know, sort of this ultra refractory component to more of a basaltic um, composition at the top. And we can see that happening in some of these larger thicker beds. And in fact, the larger the impact is, the more we see that differentiation through the stratigraphy, the smaller the beds are, um, the less variability there is um, as well, and the, the less size distribution we have. So for these bigger beds with, with a different condensation sequence, we're seeing um, much larger particles near the base and, and smaller particles up towards the top. So we're seeing a lot of, of these processes that are really exciting from like the perspective of a volcanologist might be excited about, but with completely different pressure temperature conditions, which is really cool. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning uh, how Earth is unique both in its uh, continental crust and in its plate tectonics, while also mentioning the theory of how both of those things could be a result of either the early, the late heavy bombardment or the uh, gradual decay of the uh, asteroid impacts. Now, does that also imply that there's Earth is unique somehow in the number of asteroid impacts, or are there other additional theories that uh, for why Venus, Mars don't have these, uh, the, well, the cross or the tectonics? Great, great question. So, um, so the the short answer is there should be no difference with the impact rates and the impact what's what's happening with the impacts, right? So Earth is not unique or should not be unique in terms of the amount of impacts that we're getting in comparison to the others. In fact, if anything, you know, once the moon forming event happens, the moon could potentially shield us slightly, not really a lot, but a little bit from some of the impacts. Now there's a couple different variables. So for Mars and Mercury, um, um, they're both very small, which means that um, it's, it's going to be very difficult for it, for those planets, even if they um, develop plate tectonics early on to maintain it for a long period of time because the total amount of energy is much lower. And so it is potentially possible. And in fact, for a while, people did think Mars had an ancient plate tectonic, uh, plate tectonic history, which has been since refuted. But um, it is possible that those planets very early on may have sort of had a, a bit of a fit and start and just couldn't, couldn't keep plate tectonics moving. Um, for Venus, it's much more similar to Earth in terms of its size, um, you know, its position within the solar system is very similar. Um, the reason that Venus maintained what we consider, what we call a stagnant lid as opposed to a mobile lid. So a mobile lid is plate tectonics. A stagnant lid is what Venus has. So if you imagine you're, you're boiling water on your stove top and you put a lid on top, right? It's, it's kind of, um, the water starts to boil up and eventually it kind of boils over and it kind of knocks your top of your pot over. Um, that's sort of the stagnant lid on Venus. So, you know, Venus is sort of, it's heating up, it's heating up, it's heating up, and then it's sort of it, explodes in volcanism, right? And so on Venus, we only really know what's happened in the last, you know, um, relatively, you know, few, a relatively short period of time, sort of the equivalent of looking at our Phanerozoic, right? So the last 500 million years or so. I mean, we really go a couple billion, we go in a couple billion years, but we really don't know what happened on Venus early on in Venus's history we can only see the most recent history of Venus because, and there's some alternate theories as to whether it's continuously volcanic or whether it basically upchucks itself periodically um, and completely resurfaces um, on a, a relatively regular basis. Um, but so Venus, we just don't, we can't see that far back. Um, and so we don't know whether it had plate tectonics, some of this plate tectonics was initiated um, and didn't stick, um, or why it sort of went in this runaway greenhouse um, and stagnant lid as compared to the earth. And so that's some of these important questions as to why, why did earth develop it and when did it develop? Was it like Venus early on? And how did they diverge is one of these sort of dominant questions that a lot of people in the Archean community have. Thank you very much for the answer.
Uh, professor, uh, I have a general question, and um, I have to move away shortly to, uh, a few minutes ago to take a call from one of my doctors, so I apologize if you've already answered this, but I heard that we can expect a, an impact, a major impact, um, maybe not as great as the KPG, but a major impact every 100 million years or so. And I was just wondering if there are sufficient data to support that kind of a time frame. So, um, you know, the, the there are there's sort of this it's it's sort of like earthquakes, right? There's sort of this recurrent interval that we have for impacts, similar to like we have a recurrent interval for. Um, earthquakes on the earth. And yet we can't necessarily really predict with any kind of accuracy when it's going to happen um, because it's all probabilities. Um, that said, um, you know, there's a couple, um, so the Near Earth Object Observatory um, or the Near Earth Object um, Program at NASA is doing a really great job on a very limited budget of trying to track a lot of these objects that are within our solar system um, and trying, so Apophis is one that, you know, um, that's, you know, sort of being very closely monitored as, as this very large impact. But, you know, I, I have to say, you know, a um, we'll, NASA will be tracking a big object that it's anticipating it coming in. And within that same period of time, an object the size of a football field will pass between us and the moon and that we had no idea was going to be coming, right? So um, there is just so much out there, as you guys know better than I do, there's so much out there and everything's interdependent on each other, right? And so just being able to keep track of everything and know its trajectory and know how it's going to move um, is very challenging. There's a lot of really interesting research in terms of deflecting asteroids. Um, that's going on right now. Um, you know, some of the funny ones I think are like literally painting, like going into space and painting it white to change its thermal properties to move it. I mean, there's like crazy out of the box ideas that are really, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of people working on that. And, and when I go to LPSC, the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, I've, I've definitely seen a lot more research in, in recent years on how to deflect or, or mitigate the potential for any kind of big impact. But, you know, if it happens, we won't really know. <laughs> we'll all be gone. Um, so, um, <laughs> uh. But there are, there are tons of, there is tons of material that's coming to our planet every single day, which is, I think, something we don't necessarily realize. Like, the sheer volume of extraterrestrial material that's coming to our planet, mostly in the form of dust, on a daily basis is enormous, actually. Um, we have one member that collects micrometeorites from his gutters. That's fantastic. <laughs> I tried, but I wasn't successful or I didn't know what I was looking for. So I gave up real quick. Yeah, it's a little bit harder where there's pollution and, and, and the like. It makes it a little bit trickier. Some of the, you know, there's some interesting collectors on planes and in these pans out in the middle of nowhere and stuff like that. But what do you think, Victor? Shall we take one more question? You're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Sure, one more. Sounds good. Any last question from our members here? Can you briefly discuss what uh, you did with Mars and the high rise? Uh, sure. So um, the high rise camera is a high, it stands for high resolution imaging science experiment, um, which is basically like a super spy camera that's on the Mars reconnaissance orbiter. Um, so it can take pictures. Um, down to um, 30 centimeters per pixel. Um, so we can resolve objects that are on the scale of a meter on the surface of Mars. So it's a very high resolution camera, which means um, we have to be careful or we have to um, really pick very carefully where we're going to use it because we can't image the entirety of Mars 
um, with a camera that high resolution, right? It's meant to, to sort of get these targeted um, locations. And so a lot of what I've done with that mission um, or with that spacecraft is really specifically focusing on fluvial and hydrothermal systems and trying to identify locations where um, it's good to, to image to potentially identify these fluvial or hydrothermal systems on Mars. We also did a tremendous amount of imaging for all of the different subsequent from Phoenix to, you know, um, Curiosity, right? So all of the subsequent missions, we've done a lot of this sort of high resolution imaging so we know where the rocky areas are. Um, we saved, like, or the, the teams, we saved um, uh, one of the rovers from going, um, you know, from going in a bad direction, right? So they, they like really help take images of the um, locations where these spacecraft are working. Um, and so I was fortunate to work with them and also work with them on, on outreach um, for that program. Can we right. audit your uh, planetary uh, uh, geology class sometime? <laughs> that would be great. I'll put you to work, mapping if, Jezero. If I, if I can get off work, that would be great. <laughs> well, guys, I'm gonna grab the helm back from Alexandra and from Victor here. And I, I wanna express uh, my deep uh, admiration and appreciation for that talk was magnificent. And you took us right to the cutting edge of the research you're doing. And that was really, really enjoyable. And I think we've learned a lot. So thanks for spending the evening with us.